I was told to speak up to this mic, so I'm gonna. <laughs> um, but yes, my name is Yasmin Dominguez. I'm the media partnerships coordinator for the Chicago Reader, and this is Howard March. Check it out, I'm representing. Um, and I helped create the Chicago Independent Media Alliance with the guidance of Tracy Bain that is sitting at the end here. Um, so I'm going to give the panelists a minute to introduce themselves um, and to talk a little bit about the orgs that they're representing today. Tracy. Tracy May, co-publisher of the Chicago Reader and co-founder of Windy City Times. Thanks for having us here today. Um, the Chicago Reader, when Karen Hawkins and I took over in uh, 2018, one of the things we realized is that if one of us is left the last media outlet standing, <laughs> but that one's going to fall too. We need to collaborate to survive, and especially on the revenue side. So we're going to talk a little bit today about that focus. We did get some grants for editorial coverage, but not in the same kind of deliberate way that Solving for Chicago works. So it's very complementary to the work of Solving for Chicago. Anna Deshawn, pronouns anything respectful is great. I am the founder of E3 Radio. We're an online radio station playing queer music and reporting on queer news in high rotation. I'm also the co-founder of The Q, which is going to be, going to be, the one and only curated destination for discovery of BIPOC and QTPOC music and podcasts. So um, SEMA has been a big blessing to my outlet where it's me and a few team members. Um, and so excited to talk about the crowdfunding campaign that we did and how the fundraiser for SEMA has really helped to support and sustain us during this time. So really happy to be here. I'm Sean Campbell. I'm the founder and general manager of Chirp Radio, which is a volunteer-driven independent community radio station focused on music, arts, and culture. And uh, we've been fundraising since day one to get our organization off the ground. We built the station from the ground up. And so uh, many years of fundraising campaigns under my belt. And I'm happy to be here and to be able to share some of the information that we've learned over the years. Hey everyone, can everyone hear me okay? Cool. Yes. Uh, my name is David Moran. Uh, he, him, I'm the multimedia director and producer of Soapbox Productions Organizing, which is a multimedia entity that works with grassroots organizations throughout the city of Chicago, highlighting, implementing, and documenting. Um, we joined SEMA really early on, and it was actually through a relationship with the reader. They're like, oh, these, there's groups that can give us money to do dope shit. Let's talk to them. <laughs> um, and since then, we've kind of started learning. Unlike some people, I have zero background in fundraising. I know how to talk to people. And so that's like, this was a beautiful opportunity for us to continue to expand, specifically thinking about where we were in 2020 and then kind of where we've been moving forward. So pleasure to be here. Thank you. Yeah. And there's, uh, I want to give a reasons why I asked all these panelists to join me today. Well, first, the, the annual campaign um, that I can give specific amounts of how much we raised in a second was all the idea of Tracy. This was all the, her child, her idea. <laughs> and so we worked together very closely to implement it. Um, Anna Deshawn raised the most funds last year with a whopping $26,000. So we wanted to get insight um, like how Anna, her marketing, how she pulled it off, everything that she did. Um, Sean Campbell was uh, the, one of the head for people that led the fundraising committee, and I'll get in, I'll explain the committee in a second. Um, but really, Sean's expertise, I think, is what pushed us through the four weeks long campaign, and that she really offered a lot of fundraising guidance and techniques that really helped our members um, proceed the campaign as well. And then David has been involved uh, with Soapbox for. SEMA since its inception, as well as involved in the 2020 fundraiser and the 2021 fundraiser, and has a very uh, unique perspective on both of the campaigns. So um, I'm going to get into the, the slides for a second. So before I get into the meat and potatoes of the fundraiser, I would love to share with you all a little bit more about what SEMA is and what we do. Um, if we don't mind, thank you so much. Um, so we are pretty young. We started in 2019, um, and it is a project of the Chicago Leader. Um, and I want to read to all our mission statement that is a third bullet point. So we're a partnership of independent local and community-driven media entities um, coming together in the spirit of collaboration, and especially in creating new revenue streams. Um, versus more than editorial, we are very, uh, oh, thank you. We're very dominant on uh, fundraising and creating different ways to uh, bring in new revenue into the ecosystem. 
Other things we do besides fundraising, I know that our fundraisers are kind of what put us on the national map. It's how I met Stephanie. Um, it's kind of brought us, brought SEMA to the national table with uh, media collaborations. But what other things that we do? We found that by working together collectively, um, we can advocate for Chicago's hyperlocal media outlets on any state or national level media efforts. Um, one of those examples is the Illinois Journalism Task Force that's forming. SEMA will have a seat at that table. Um, we have our joint fundraisers. We host member to member trainings where, for example, like Sean's expertise on fundraising, she was able to train all other members on successful fundraising techniques. And we have it for other development types of, of, of uh, programming as well. Um, and we also build visibility campaigns. So we also know that eyeballs and clicks are as important as dollars to us. So we try to create campaigns that bring more visibility, not only to the Alliance, but of our 69 members. Um, so if we can click the next slide. Yeah, so we have a total of 69 members representing 81 media entities. They're all very different from each other. So from nonprofit newsrooms to dynamic uh, video productions, we have podcasts, et cetera. Um, we cover all together. We cover a wide array, uh, wide array of different groups of Chicago community members. And what does involvement look like for a SEMA member? Um, you can participate in any sort of project. They're all opt in, opt out. And we are, we do have committees that we build within the alliance that help us make these overhead decisions. Um, and Tracy, I would love you to talk a little bit about why uh, yourself and Karen Hawkins decided to create SEMA. Well, Karen and I both have been in Chicago media, me for 38 years, Karen for over 20, um, and have seen collaborations come and go. Um, usually there's like a two or three year lifespan and without resources, they collapse because you need a staff person, at least one, to get it going. And Yasmin has been an absolute find and dream. And I think Sima would have collapsed had we had the round higher. So Yasmin has kept this together. Um, but uh, we knew that it needed to be resourced. I also felt like peer to peer was the way to go because we've seen academic institutions try this. We've seen merely large corporate entities try this and it fails because it's not peer to peer at the community level. So this was very deliberately a community-based media, Chicago-based, not national corporate um, media. There are times for those collaborations. This particular one we felt needed to be peer to peer. A lot of our projects we wanted to make sure were funded, meaning um, when we got uh, two different census grants, it was to pay members to write stories. So collaboratives are great, but if, if nobody's getting paid for their time, so for example, committee members this year will be paid a stipend for their time um, because their time is their treasure. Um, and then we've also done some joint advertising campaigns. I think the biggest exciting thing revenue-wise that we hope to happen over the next couple of years is mimicked after the, um, the community media program at City University of New York. We've been collaborating with them for a couple of years to learn about how they were able to shift government advertising into over 200 community media outlets in New York City. It is so far along that they've got it ingrained into law in New York City. So we kind of saw those things as possibilities for Chicago because of the great collaboration. But the gap we saw was the revenue side in the big way. So that's that's where we were at in deciding that, you know, the Chicago Reader had enough of a hurdle ahead of it. But if we didn't lift the whole ecosystem to get more resources overall into every kind of outlet, the Reader would fail as well. So the final thing I'll say is we're trying to push for a, a pooled journalism fund in Chicago, 40 plus of our members and a couple non-members signed on to a pooled fund letter to the foundation world um, to say that it's great that we're looking at these large, large outlets to fund like the merger with sometimes in BEZ, but we don't want a lopsided ecosystem. We want to make sure we bring up the rest of the ecosystem and a pooled fund is one of those ways um, to host at a community foundation where um, a lot of smaller outlets, one person outlets, startups, as well as 100 year plus legacy outlets um, that are small have a chance to get those resources too. Our, most of our members do not have development directors um, or all the kind of, even a sales director uh, to attract to small media is hard. So if we do it collaboratively, we can bring more overall for everybody. Um, and the funders are also more aware of that. Okay. so. Now that we gave a little bit of a synopsis of SEMA and what we do, we're going to switch over to what this conversation is supposed to be about. So um, how that how hyperlocal media outlets collectively came together to fundraise dollars. So before we get into like the meat and potatoes and the details of that, I want to share some takeaways with you all. 
Um, so the first year we did our joint fundraiser was in 2020. It was a direct response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The Chicago Reader was facing um, big financial losses. And then we decided that we were going to survey our members because we cannot be the only ones that are in this, uh, this trouble. And so sure enough, we found that all of us were taking huge financial losses literally from months within a three month period and that we decided to create this fundraiser. Um, it was a one month long fundraiser. We raised an average of 160,000 total, 60,000 in matching and 101,000 in public donations. Exactly 972 donors, 43 outlets in this one and the same, we had 43 outlets in the 2021 fundraiser. Um, our slogan was journalism for the people, by the people. We had the hashtag Save Chicago Media. And probably the biggest takeaway that we got was that two thirds of our donors decided to donate to all. And something that I want to make clear is that there were three ways a donor could donate to the campaign. They could donate, say, like $20 to the Chicago Reader. So they have one donation to one outlet. Or they could donate to multiple outlets at different amounts. So we could do... 20 Reader, 20 Soapbox, 20 Chirp, 20 E3 Radio, all in one transaction. Um, or they could split their donation, say of $100 evenly through all 43 outlets. So there was three ways that people could donate. So two thirds of, our, of those 972 donors decided to split their donation evenly amongst all 43 outlets. So that was our biggest takeaway that we took. Um, and I don't know if, if either any of you would like to talk about how your experience was in that first year of the campaign and, and what takeaways you all had. I mean, I can go. <laughs> it was, um, was mind blowing to me because I'm a very small outlet. It's me and some few core team members and we needed money. <laughs> it's a very simple thing. It costs a lot of money. Um, radio station, we're online, hosting, publishing, you know, all the things. And I was surrounded by a collective group of folks who had the same need and who were just as invested in seeing us all, you know, win essentially. And I was really inspired by the community aspect of it all, um, which starts with Tracy for everyone that knows Tracy, it starts mm -hmm. with her and Karen, but there, there wasn't this competitive thing. Yeah. You know, it was like we were talking in the Slack channels, like, did you get 43 cent? I got 43 <laughs> cent, too. <laughs> when, when one person can get $50 across 40 some outlets, you get like 43 cents. And so there'll be these messages excited about that 43 cents. You know, there was something happening that we knew that something special was happening. And so it was just really amazing for me to see it all come together from the meetings to the marketing. Like, I know we're going to talk about it later, but the marketing is incredibly important as to how this all worked together. And it was just really inspiring, honestly. Yeah. And I think one of the things that we really saw is everybody knew what the situation was. There was a clear message. There was clear urgency. And people care about your outlet. It makes a difference in people's lives. And so it's important to tell that story and people do respond. And I think initially maybe there was some concern because everything was so uncertain that people would be hesitant to spend money. But I think what we found was kind of, poco a poco. Felt like I really want to help. And so in that first year of the campaign, I think there was a lot of, of that urgency. Yeah, and I think the, the only thing I would add is so for, for us at that time, relatively new nonprofit because we were like debating for a while. And so coming into the nonprofit game, looking at like, these are grants, we're like, oh shit. And so when we figured out like these things were taking place for us, it was trusting and knowing the entities that were also part of it. So like Black Club Shy, we had a relationship with City Bureau, Ergo Radio. So some of the entities that were like forming together, were like, okay, we know them, we know them. And so there was a level of trust that even kind of started moving forward in that 2020 fundraiser and has stemmed off. I know I've had, or Soapbox has had the opportunity to work in relationship with a lot of these entities outside of the like SEMA thing, right? But SEMA clearly is the starting branch to all of it, which I think is a wonderful opportunity that I don't know if we would have had any other way, you know? Let me explain a little bit because we had nonprofit and for-profit. So here's how it worked in both years. And this year it'll, it's going to be in the fall because the reader had a little bit of a delay this year. <laughs> um, in the fall, um, several foundations put in money. The Crossroads Fund, which is a local uh, grassroots funder, hosted the matching dollars. So the reader did not. The donations... Um, last year, we were able to figure out even more. The donations went right to people's, uh, the, 
then to these bank accounts, they were not tax deductible. We were very clear that if you as an individual give, it's not tax deductible because we couldn't, we couldn't promise that because uh, most of our members are for profit. We are very low profit, but they're for profit. Mm -hmm. So it's not tax deductible. The matching money then went to when you got a direct donation. And um, so the Crossroads Fund then administered those as grants, even to the for-profit outlets. And they have agreed to do that again this year. So this year, uh, so first year, I think we had around 60,000 in matching, and the second year, 70,000. Mm -hmm. I was terrified the second year would go, would be a bomb. I kept saying, yeah. that was during the height of the early years of COVID. We may not get the donations, but we actually about matched. Uh, was there, we actually raised about 10,000 more the second year. Yeah. So we could take it to the next slide. Okay, um, and going off what Tracy just said, yes, both Tracy and I were very like nervous and scared to do this campaign because there was so much urgency behind the 2020. Like people were, you know, donating to different types of organizations, not just media, but you know, to help the ecosystem in, in all kinds of ways. So this year was different. The pandemic was still going on. Um, I mean, like it was still going on. We were still feeling the economic brunt. So we decided to do it again. And we were, we had the goal to raise more money, but we were being very humble. We knew there was a chance we could not, we wouldn't reach those goals because we thought people wouldn't give. We were wrong. People gave more. Um, so this, in this Fundraiser, we an average of 172,795 were raised. So we had more in matching funds with 77,500 and a little less in public donations. So we had 96,295, a little less donors by, I can't do math, 931, thank you. <laughs> 43, the same number of members, 43, same number of, of days, it was about a month long same May, June timeframe. Uh, our slogan was investing in local media equals funding your community. Same hashtag just for familiarity purposes, but we did add a second one, local media are essential. And the big takeaway in this campaign was the triple match incentive that was new that we didn't do in the first year. Um, we also extended the campaign by one more day that resulted in 200 more last minute donations that really was the reason it pushed us over the edge in last year's, in 2020's numbers. Um, so Tracy, if you want to talk about the triple match. Incentive. Yeah, right. I guess near the end of the campaign, it was kind of going a little slow. So I'm sure it was Sean and a couple other people, I think City Bureau recommended, hey, why don't we do a triple match? And oh my God, <laughs> it was nuts. And we can, now you can't really plan for that because if people know it's going to be a triple match, they might not promote it. So I think we'll do the triple match on the front end, like the first few days of the campaign. Um, but it was really great. And we, at, at people capped out because one of the important things was that we didn't want any one of our members because some of our members, including the reader, are larger than other members. So there's a cap. I, I think it's 20%. Um, the, the most any uh, outlet can get of the, the, the matching dollars is I think 20%. So E3 hit the cap. That's how well. And it's, um, that way, you know, Black Club, for example, has 18,000 members, right? Like if they, they could take the whole match money uh, right away. So it was on a day-to-day -day basis, a rolling. So we, we maxed our match uh, right before the end of the campaign, I think. So it was, it was actually really exciting, very collaborative um, in terms of people having ideas like, ooh, let, let's do this so we can get even more. So I think that that triple match made it possible for us to to basically um, surpass the prior year. Yeah, um, okay, so I've been asked a lot um, if this model can be replicated in other parts of the country. Um, I, I think it can, and I'm gonna try to share some key action items that I led before the official launch of the campaign. Um, number one, it took us about five to six months to organize this campaign for it to be one month long. So it, it took a good chunk of, at the time I was the only full-time reader staffer leading the Chicago Independent Appeal Alliance. So it took me like half a year to, to create all the things needed. Part of that was building a donation website. So we had one for 2020 that we completely rebranded and rebuilt for 2021. Um, how that works is that this year, part of, well, first, I built the campaign based completely on feedback from people in 2020. One of the biggest feedback that I got was that people wanted access to their own reports um, for how many donations were coming in because we built the 2020 fundraiser so quickly that we didn't 
have the infrastructure for members to have or access their own reports of how much money they had coming in. So we built a website with Dojo, our developer. I always have to shout them out because they did such good work. Um, it, our website on the back end works like an e-commerce site. Um, and that was really the only way we could find. So a, a donation is read as a donation on the front end. On the back end, it's read as a transaction pretty much. So that's how we were creating reports for each of our members. Um, there's, we utilize Stripe um, for people to make their own Stripe accounts, connected it on the back end of our site. So every time someone donated, it went directly to their bank account. Um, we didn't, it didn't stick, sit in our, our SEMA reader bank account. It just went straight to theirs. Um, at the end of the fundraiser, they had back end access on WordPress to see how much like member reports, which was different than the first year, which took off a lot of work on my end as having to curate those reports on the first year. Um, key, 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 implementing a fundraising committee. There are so many decisions that have to be made that one person or a group of two people making them, it's not, it's not going to fly. I, the, I found more that collective decisions were the best way to get everyone, because there was 43 members, it was the best way to get everyone on board to know what was going on at the same time. Um, and the fundraising committee helped me with the marketing, helped me with the language, the theme, the look, the art of it. They approved everything. They <laughs> edited my, my like uh, advertising or marketing language. Um, yeah, so we developed a marketing strategy. And so I wanna ask our panelists, um, how did you all decide to market your own outlets for this 2021 fundraiser? Um, also another big, feedback I got was it was difficult to ask for individual donations when we're all collectively asking for donations to go to all. So I just want to turn it to, to these three and see how you all navigated that. First of all, let me say, I wasn't worried about the second campaign. <laughs> I knew it was going to be a successful. The first campaign you ever do will be the hardest campaign you do. And you can still do it. But what you're doing in that first campaign is kind of setting it up and building an expectation among your, your constituents. And so I think that the messaging, um, you know, is really important. And every outlet has a different message. There are no cookie cutter messages. You know your audience best. You know what you do best and what your community values. So really setting up those messages when you're fundraising and thinking about all the different channels you can deliver those messages on you know, whether it's your social media, whether it's an email list, whether it's in your outlet uh, itself, you know, obviously we ran spots on the air and talk to our listeners directly. We also have a culture of fundraising in our organization. So our listeners know what to expect. And that's why your second campaign will always be easier because you've created that culture with the first campaign and human beings are creatures of habit. So the second time they see it, if they gave the first time, they're like, oh, that again. I love that outlet. Absolutely. Here's some money. And um, but but really speaking to your audience, don't look at what everybody else is doing. I mean, you can just to get ideas, but really think about what is meaningful about your outlet. Why do people care about it? And use that message in your fundraising. And that's what we always do. Does anybody like that? Yeah, I think for for us, we were intentional on being like, let's just pull for everyone because also. At the same time, just a little bit earlier, Soapbox had done its own little fundraiser. So we're like, this is a cool opportunity to continue to raise money. Even though we just did one, we can now kind of just shift the narrative on like, oh, this is all of us, save Chicago media, rather than just Soapbox. And I think for that first fundraiser, I think those were some of the things that helped a little more. And then the second one, it was notably why like we made, as, as an entity, a little less money than the first one, because that shared pool pot wasn't as big, right? But I think the key factor then is looking at other dollars or philanthropy dollars and how that can influence what we all got. So that was cool. And for me, we were successful because we had already planned on having a fundraising campaign. And so we had something that was working and I just decided <coughs> to break all the rules and do two at the same time, right? <laughs> Which will, anyone will tell you that's a bad idea, but it worked for us. Um, and when the double and triple donations came through, I, I literally was working a month in advance I had my spreadsheet. I was calling people um, because you know your people. Uh, at least if you don't know your people, you should know your people. And so I knew the people who I needed to call. I knew the people who I could text. I knew the people who I could, needed to send an email to. 
or the people who needed both. And so I had gone through my list and I was telling people what we were fundraising for, what we needed. I had just quit my corporate job that February. So this was like an important moment (laughs) um, of survival for what we were doing. And so people were prepared to give because people need to budget, right? I live on a budget, you live on a budget. Um, And so I was calling it advance. And so when the double, triple dollars came in, I called everybody again because (laughs) we had our Indiegogo campaign, which was going well. But at the same time, I had some larger donors. And by larger, I mean, people were giving $500. Um, For me, that's a big donation. But that 500 was 1,500 when the triple match came in. And so I was like, can y'all read budget <laughs> for me and wait until this moment and hit the site because your donation is going to go a lot further if you give through SEMA than with me. And so I did do that. I do also know some folks who were like, yeah, I'm doing that for you, but I'm also donating to all. Um, so I know that that happened as well. So for me, it was a lot of upfront preparation That really proved to be the secret to our success and really just taking the time to talk to folks around what was important to them, why they wanted to support us. And and that's really why we were able to hit our goal. Yeah. And so the reader, we did we promoted both aspects of the promoted, certainly support the reader. But um, the reason we really started this was because I know that, you know, we're at a collaborative journalism summit. Funders like collaboratives, individuals like collaboratives, the people that we're going to give to a collaborative wouldn't necessarily have given individually or they will additionally, right? It's a separate give. So I was never worried about it cannibalizing the reader fundraiser, really the reverse. I knew that if all of us promoted this campaign, more of us would get it, like more money would come into the ecosystem than ever would have before. And then ongoing donors down the line. So the reader promoted both aspects of this to our entire, you know, 50,000 person email list to 60,000 print copies during the campaign, um, all of our social media, the SEMA social media. Um, so we did it for both. And each year we were like third or fourth place. Yeah. Right. I was really glad we didn't win the first year because then it would have been like, oh, the reader just did this to get the money. No, we didn't want to win. <laughs> we wanted the whole system to win. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, and, and I would add to like, then once things started going for, uh, for us groups that are a little smaller in capacity, um, everything was laid out pretty cake. And so whether that was social media for like Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, and or like newsletter stuff, everything was packaged in such a, such a way that it was difficult to mess up, which is great when you got a hundred things going on. And so I do think that that ease in, in trainings prior to in that 2020 and, you know, renewed in 2021 really helped a lot of our team members, um, be able to feel like they can engage and feel like they're participating in something, uh, even if it's for the first time. Yeah. Okay. Um, I heard there was questions. Yes. Um, we've got two questions from our uh, virtual attendees. So I'll pitch them both. And then I bet you all have some questions too. Um, and then after this, we're going to wrap. Thank you for collaborative meditation and then lunch. So the first question is, can you say more about how the member committees help advise seamless programming and planning? Um, so we had one committee for this fundraiser that I mentioned helped put together marketing. We are actually in the very beginning phases of starting a steering committee um, that will be compensated for their time, but that will help myself and our other SEMA coordinator make overhead decisions. So I can speak more on how the fundraising committee helped us create. Um, Okay, so, well, Sean was part of our fundraising committee. And like I mentioned, I built the fundraiser this year completely based on feedback from last year. One of the biggest feedbacks we got was that people felt really unprepared to fundraise um, just because they've never done it before. Like Tracy has mentioned, we do have smaller scale outlets. So what I brought to the committee was let's create a training prior to the launch of the campaign on best fundraising strategies and practices. So Sean, who was one of the committee members led that training. So our committee members helped us make decisions, but our committee members also were involved in training and leading other members. I view the committee as part of my team. Like I didn't view them as an extension. I viewed them as my side side coworkers. Like they were, they were my go-to team. Um, so we made a lot of overhead decisions together. I gave them a lot of authority over things um, and let them correct me on things all the time. So I hope that answers the question that we made. Oh, good. Yeah. So, so one more question and then we'll open it up to folks in person is um, from Lisa Rudman. I'm interested in the follow-ups and stewardship with individual donors after the campaign to help them get closer to each outlet. 
Other than names and contact information. Yes. Um, so, so that was something I had to do manually and is something I'm hoping to build into our website le uh, next year. So our website only gave us re number-based reports, money reports. I had to, our website, when people gave, they wrote their name, their email. We had a privacy policy saying how we would use their name. So that's a key thing, have a privacy policy. So then um, every, every outlet on the back end, say the Chicago Reader, would be populated with how many uh, member names, their emails, and their addresses. So then I would export that into a PDF file and send it to each one of our 43 individual uh, campaign members. And so from there, they would take that and they would send thank yous, which Sean could talk about thank yous and how important that is. So I'll talk to you for that. Yeah. Um, a big part of any successful fundraising campaign and building that culture of fundraising, again, is making sure that you thank your donors. Um, sometimes it's easy to feel like the campaign's done, you made money, you're like, yeah, success. And people overlook the fact that you need to go back and, and, and tell the people thank you uh, who gave to your campaign. That makes it so much more likely that they'll give again. It makes them know that their gift was appreciated. And again, you can do that in a lot of different ways because you know your audience best. You can send an email. You can send a handwritten card if you've got a physical address. Uh, you might even offer some sort of a, a little incentive. You know, you send out a bumper sticker or something like that. But people really just want to know that their donation is appreciated. So don't overlook that portion of the campaign. Um, even just a short thank you email, um, you know, from a, a recognizable name uh, can make a real difference and, and let people know how much you care because it's important that they know how, that you care. You want to add to that? Oh, I was sending thank yous when they... <laughs> when it landed in my inbox um, because people would give and, or they'd say, I'm going to give, I'm going to give. But the moment I saw it, I sent them a quick message. I did something formally later, um, but there's something about that immediate response. Like, oh, they got it. Um, that, and sometimes it literally was just, thank you so much. And I think it was very well received. I did more of a formal thing after the campaign wrap, um, but I was responding right away. Yeah, and that's awesome. And we had an auto response yeah. to okay. that went into their email saying what they just gave to. Yeah. But it wasn't as, as special as coming from the outlets that folks might have given to directly. Yeah. And you can never overthink people. Yeah. So if they get the recognition, the you know, the auto responder, and then they get a personal message or they get a quick email and then they get a, a card in the mail or something, nobody's going to be like, why are they thanking me so much? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can I have a question? Sure. Now I have a question. I'm just wondering, thinking through, you know, you've got 43 members and they're all kind of getting into this, but obviously in different ways. How do you kind of um, make things fair and equitable on the, like, what you put into it because you're all getting a share of what comes out of it? How do you determine that are the requirements for the different members in order to participate in something like this? Just wondering. So just to clarify, there's 69 members of SEMA that represent about 81 outlets, right? So every project we do is opt in each year, 43 outlets opted in. There was slight overlap, like there were some that came and went. Um, you're right on the, the fundraiser, what you put into it, you get more out of it, right? But we are going to make a minimum threshold, which the committee will decide probably a hundred or something token amount, because that at least shows you tried. There were some members that were in the shared pool that, that individually only raised like a dollar. So it was very clear they weren't really pushing it. Um, but on a lot of the different other projects we do, it's it's kind of what you put in, you get out. So we've done a lot of member-to-member -member trainings. We had an audience engagement training from Harkin a couple weeks ago that we always tape so that if you can't participate, you can do it later. We, we want to have very low expectations given the labor involved with collaborations. And we absolutely are trying to get more funding so that if you are on a committee, you get compensated. And that, and that will incentivize. And if you participate in an editorial collaboration, because of a grant, you're getting compensated, right? There's just because they're so small, um, we have to value that time, but we're working on that. We're trying to grow to add more staff as well as more resources overall for SEMA. Yes. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, it sounded like the triple matching was really impactful. Who, who was matching? So last year's uh, Joyce Foundation, MacArthur Foundation, thank you very much. Um, uh, the um, McCormick, um, Feinberg, and I might be missing one, chicagoreader.com slash SEMA, C-I-M-A, 
as our reports from everything we've been talking about today, including both years reports that Yasmin put together, it'll tell you all the funders. This year, MacArthur has agreed to again, Crossroads Fund is hosting it, and we've got requests in that could um, give us even more than the 70,000 we raised last year. So if all the requests go through, we might be around a hundred thousand dollar match this year. And on the triple match, we'll probably do it on the front end. So the first five days of the campaign, we're, we're going to be meeting with BEZ tomorrow to talk about doing our campaign this fall and not in a way that conflicts with their campaign locally. And that then they may cross promote our campaign, which will really up the level of, of people knowing about it, um, that are, that are not aware of what SEMA even is. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's foundations uh, that we're doing it through locally, and I could definitely see it growing. And if the pooled fund ever comes to be in Chicago, I could see this being embedded in that project, right? Like that more funders might get involved in a in a less lift for us, because basically it's just me asking funders right now. Um, it's not very it's not very institutionalized, um, so we want to get that less uh, random and more more in the system of funding of Chicago. Yeah. And I just want to say, too, that I have printed out copies of the reports that list all of our founders that gave to the matching fund. So I'll hand one to you. But Tracy listed them all. It's McCormick, MacArthur, Joyce Feinberg, and uh, two individual donors, too. Great. I have time for one more question. One more question? Yes? Yeah. I was curious um, what, like, the average donation was? Um, our, so in individually each one of our outlets that promoted the fundraiser including the matching fund walked away with a total of about between one thousand and one thousand four hundred dollars um so that was the average but so that was the average to the SEMA members the average donor was around a hundred bucks oh yes um and that's what was fascinating to us because that's a high number especially for the first campaign and it's because they didn't want to choose it's because two thirds, I would have never guessed it would have been two thirds of the people coming in gave to everybody because they were all coming in from our individual promotion. You know, we weren't getting a lot of other mainstream media on this. This was our members promoting it to their audiences. And I would have said a third. The two thirds number stood both years yeah. and the average stood both years. So I think people, it is showing us that people really do want to support these kind of collaborations and they discovered new media outlets. Readers of the Reader found out about Soapbox and vice versa. You know, like that really was an added benefit that, um, you know, we heard from a Chicago Tribune journalist contacted us and said, God, I had no idea there's this many outlets in Chicago. I'm like, this is like a third of the members. Like we have 69, but there's well over 100 outlets in Chicago, probably even 200 if you count brokered radio and stuff. So really it's an educational effort as much as it is a fundraiser. Yeah, like I always mentioned to us, well, my values with SEMA, yes, dollars are very important, but so are eyeballs and people knowing the names. So this campaign raised funds, but it also increases the visibility and popularity of a, a lot of different hyperlocal and smaller outlets in the city. There's a lot. Thank you all. Thank you so much.